Thank you, Bill and Jennifer, for inviting me to share here tonight. And Kate, thank you so much for all the support that you've given me as I've been preparing. Over the decades, as I have overcome poverty, lots of people have marveled at my family's bizarre story. Tonight, I'm, I can tell you about it with clear eyes because I escaped, and I have a very happy ending. Think about Alice in Wonderland fighting the Jabberwocky, or the heroine who battles her way through an epic Stephen King story. Bizarre, funny, harrowing, tragic, and finally, triumphant. I'm financially comfortable, I have a loving family, an excellent career, a beautiful home right nearby, good health, community ties, and a rich spiritual life. I stood up to the Jabberwocky and somehow I won. The fact is, <laughs> Been told to slow down. I don't know where it is. <laughs> the fact is that I was born into multi generational poverty and I broke free. My family's battlefield is littered with dead and twisted bodies, casualties of the war. Filled with heartbreaking stories of poverty, mental illness, trauma, alcoholism, I was freed from the heartbreak of those lives that came before me over 10 years ago because all those lives that came before passed away. Both of my parents' lives ended early, so I can tell my story to you without having to worry about hurting them. My dad died at 55 through suicide, my mom at 59 from heart disease. Poverty wants to lay blame on previous generations, keeping us trapped as victims in endless cycles of anger and shame. But I'll tell you right now, no parent wakes up one morning and says to themselves, I think today is the day that I'm going to screw up my kid's life just doesn't work like that. I love my mom and my dad and their parents. I have chosen to forgive their mistakes and I'm confident that they're with us here tonight, cheering us on. They were all intelligent, caring people who did their best. My parents met when they were 15, both from families that were wounded by alcoholism and poverty. Of course, they found comfort in each other's arms and as the song says, leading to a scandalous teenage pregnancy at church Bible camp. Um, they sparked up that generational misery machine once again. Two years later, they were divorced, I was born, and my tiny universe contained only my 19-year-old mother and my two-year-old brother. My mom called us the three musketeers. Poverty forced our little family to constantly pull up stakes, starting over, and our sad story turned darker and darker as time passed. Think about those little crosses or shrines that mark a death on the side of the road. They're called descansos. Pick a day and I'll show you a descanso. As a child, I yelled loudly and often with very, very creative distress calls and they fell on deaf ears. Living in San Jose in the late 1960s, I remember walking alone to kindergarten along a very busy six lane street, talking to myself in a made up gibberish language because nobody was around and I was lonely, so I talked myself. I lit my bedroom on fire. I shoplifted food. I got caught and scolded and, and released with a warning because I was an adorable little blonde haired girl with blue eyes and I could talk my way out of trouble. I often ran away from home, riding away on my broken bicycle from our tiny little duplex at first light. Eventually, I would watch as the street lights would go on at dusk hearing my mother calling out for me, wanting me to come home, but I dreaded to go home, and so I just would wait out in the dark. I hid from babysitters, <clears throat> cruel, cruel babysitters who did shameful things to me and my brother, stowing away in the back of the family station wagon. I hid under a blanket so mom wouldn't drag me, that wouldn't take me back there again. I got dragged back anyway, this time for a week, a dozen descansos for me and my brother that week. After my, my, at my after school daycare program, I scored off the charge on their IQ tests and I made life-size drawings of adults doing forbidden things. The teachers marveled at my intelligence and artistic talent. <laughs> nobody noticed, nobody said anything, nobody did anything. Finally, the police showed up at our door one day, so promptly we moved to Florida. The last time I saw a babysitter was in first grade. After that, my brother and I went, ran wild in the streets and canals of Central Florida. 
I was a fierce little tomboy, a cute but feral little baby wolf who had not been socially properly socialized. I bit other kids, I got into fights, I landed in the principal's office, and I also got off with the scolding because I was cute and I could talk my way out of trouble. In third grade, I ran with my brother's teenage gang who loved to cut school and egg cars. We would shoplift and then congregate in our empty house to smoke cigarettes and terrorize the neighborhood. I swam alone in our backyard canal filled with alligators and cottonmouth snakes. And finally, in third grade, I had my first trip to the dentist, who just shook his head as he filled a half dozen cavities. In 1972, my mom knew that things were bad and that she needed to get us home. So she moved us back to California, where her own mother allowed the three musketeers to crowd into her dark, alcoholic little house in Placerville. My brother and I shared a room crammed with the bunk beds that were still charred from my earlier arson attempts. I, I joined fourth grade at Sierra School and temporarily stopped ditching. It was the closest to normal that we ever had known and life started getting better. The Descansos began to wane, but I was nine years old and I had already died a thousand times. Some of you may remember the Blair Brothers Lumber Company at the corner of Main Street and Broadway. It was just around the corner from our moldy little shack on Spanish Ravine. That lumber yard was my playground, and I have so many ridiculous stories about the antics that we pulled, the funny and harrowing escapes in the wilds of El Dorado County, and accompanying stories of pain, loneliness, and darkness. Lots of desconsos, but I made it out. My beautiful brother did not make it out intact. He became a statistic, a shell of his younger self, I mourn him, but I have been forced to let him go as he returned to dark and lonely places where I just could not follow. As a young woman, I turned away from that darkness and I left El Dorado County behind, following a call that lasted the next 30 years to heal my, to heal my family's wounds. Over and over again, I grabbed my sword and jumped through revolving doors in pursuit of freedom. After decades of wandering the field, I returned to my beloved hills and trees to finally slay the Jabberwocky. And now, after clearing away the battlefield debris, I'm here with you. Yay! <laughs> previous generations didn't have. And this is for me. One, mental faculties. I had intelligence, education, and knowledge to use good judgment. Thanks to genetics for my high IQ and thanks to El Dorado High School for a solid education. <laughs> Two, health and personal safety. I have access to healthy living conditions and medical, dental, and mental health care. Thank you, Planned Parenthood on Spring Street, for giving me free birth control so I could stop the cycle of teenage pregnancy. <laughs> Three, economic choices. When I was 18, I got a job opportunity to pay for my own food, clothing, and shelter. Thank you, Blue Shield of California for offering a career path so I could become financially self-supporting. And number four, emotional well-being. I'm able to respond to life situations without self-destructive behavior. Thank you to dozens of mental health, I mean dozens, of <laughs> mental health professionals for healing countless traumas and giving me the freedom to treat myself with generosity and forgiveness instead of fear and shame. Five, cultural, cultural and social networks. I've learned to fit into society. I'm not a baby wolf anymore unless you make me mad. And, and yeah, and that's really true. <laughs> and um, I've learned how to build support networks of friends, family, and community. Thank you to countless loved ones over the decades who have forgiven me while I figured out how to become a civilized human being. And a lot of those people are right here at these tables right here. And finally, a spiritual connection. I have the willingness to believe in divine purpose and a moral compass. This isn't the same as organized religion, but more an awareness of natural laws. Thank you to all of my spiritual advisors for the wisdom to harness this force that leads me out of suffering. 
So today I live in a new chapter and I know that I received the very best parts of my family. I'm so grateful to be here tonight and so grateful that I was asked to do this because in doing so, I was offered a choice to let myself fall back in love with those three musketeers. I had closed that dark chapter many years ago and put it up on the shelf. Through this journey with your, you here tonight, I pulled it back down, dusted it off, spent time with those ancient photo albums. I reminisced, I laughed, I cried, I forgave, and then I dried out my eyes and I came here to be with all of you here tonight. Thank you for caring about your community. Thank you for the privilege of letting me serve on the membership committee of the Women's Fund El Dorado, part of the El Dorado Community Foundation. So proud and happy to be with all of you and thank you all so much because now I'm thrilled this talk is behind me and I can turn it back over to the stage. <laughs> Tiffany, thank you so very, very much. There is no better way to begin our evening than with your story. We really do appreciate your willingness to share it with us. So I also will say good evening. I'm Kathy Bean. I currently serve as the chairperson of the Women's Fund El Dorado Cabinet. Now, normally, facilitating a panel conversation is not in the job description of a chairperson of the cabinet. However, I was asked to do this. I will give it my best shot, and I know that our wonderful group of folks here will do an amazing job in sharing their story, their information with you. So, with that, I'd like to do a few introductions. You've already met Tiffany. Tiffany, as you know, is from El Dorado County. She has a long history here. She belongs here. She's built a career here. And her career as an organizational change management consultant, that's a mouthful, takes you to Sacramento several days a week. In her spare time, she enjoys community service and several different organizations, including the Women's Fund of El Dorado. Tiffany's focus is to help others transform their lives through spiritual community, family, and work. She's a graduate of El Dorado High School, and she proclaims we are sexy, we are fun, we are the class of 81. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also like to introduce to you, give me one second and I'll get back into my notes where I should be. Honorable Dylan Sullivan. Dylan was elected to the judgeship in 2014 in June. However, due to circumstances, the governor did appoint her to that same judgeship in September. And so rather than wait to take office in January, she took office in September. Prior to being um, a judge of our superior court, she was also a commissioner. She also had several different positions within the legal profession and has served um, in her private practice as a criminal attorney. I'd like to introduce to you also Dr. Veronica Velasquez Morphin. Dr. Morphin came to us from UC Davis and UC San Francisco. She has focused her career on helping the underserved receive the services that they need. She mentors young doctors. She has been a leader in her profession and has achieved a number of awards that speak to her commitment to community service and to helping those in need. Dr. Edna Ansala comes to us from Sacramento. He's currently serving as the Deputy Superintendent of the El Dorado County of Education. He's in charge of educational services. 
That means he is responsible for all of the services and programs that the county office offers relative to the education of students and to the training of teachers. He works with things such as child development, professional development. He serves um, in a leadership capacity in anything having to do with data and achievement. And he is a wonderful model of what an educator can bring to the profession. Ed comes to us from San Francisco, I'm sorry, from Sacramento. I just caused you to move a little bit. Comes to us from Sacramento where he served as the Chief of Staff in Sacramento City School District. He also served as Superintendent and Principal for St. Pope Charter School in Sacramento. During his tenure um, in charge of Sacramento High School, he actually was able to move the college attendance rate from 25% of his graduates to 75% of his graduates. That is quite We are very happy to have all four of our panelists here. We know that they have information you would like to hear. Before we begin though, I, there are a couple of things that I would like you to keep in mind. First of all, we have a set of questions that have been prepared in, by the Education Committee of the Women's Fund because we wanted to make sure we had a broad base of questions that might help us better focus our thinking relative to how we want to manage our grant making. So we do have a series of questions. We also have an opportunity for you to ask questions that might be on your mind. And so, at your table, you have cards, and if in fact you have a question that is not included in the questions that we have prepared, which are also at your table, by the way, then please feel free to write it down. Katie Peake will come and collect it, and then if we have time at the end of our panel discussion, we will ask your questions that you have written down. Now, if perchance we don't have time, to ask your particular question. I know that our panelists would be more than happy to spend a few minutes after our program is over and just kind of go down and be available to answer the questions that you might have. So, as we begin, be aware that each question as it is asked will be up on the screen, so you can see it that way. You can see it at your table. We've asked each individual panelist to begin the conversation on specific questions. Other panelists will be able to jump in at whatever point they'd like to, but we're gonna start with a designated person and then allow an opportunity for all panelists to contribute to the answer to that question. So, with that, how about if we start? So we're gonna start with Ed. And the question is, how does your workplace identify children in poverty? And once identified, are they red flagged? Or are there special services that might be available to them? So, uh, first of all, I just wanna say uh, thank you. Before I answer the question, thank you for um, giving us the opportunity to speak on such a critical need throughout our community and county and um, just being able to address such a, a bold vision to break cycles of poverty. Uh, you know, for me, um, be it in my role, be it inside of the classroom, or a, a principal, or even a superintendent, I know uh, what it's like when there's a, a collective focus on um, breaking cycles of poverty. And even this past weekend, I received an email from um, one of my students who's going to be graduating from law school. Uh, and it's just um, that sense of possibility. And so once again, uh, being here tonight is, is uh, very inspiring and encouraging for all of us. In, in terms of identification in the education environment, um, students in poverty are identified, really self-identified. So families who uh, are eligible for free or reduced lunch um, there's a certain threshold in which families are, are making and once again are uh, identified as uh, 
being able to receive free or reduced lunch. So in our county in particular, there are approximately 30% of families are eligible. Uh, also, if a family is homeless and they're willing to identify that uh, at the point of registration or into the school, we're also aware of their needs. I think more importantly, there's the informal identification of families that are in need as well. And that comes through the relationships of teachers or counselors or administrators or anyone who's engaging in, in um, educational environment. And these needs emerge anywhere from, it, it could be academic needs or behavioral needs or truancy. And through that engagement with the family, we, we identify those needs. And when it comes to services, um, they're very comprehensive. So it can be counseling services, mentoring services, academic interventions, homeless services, uh, even to parenting needs or alcohol and drug uh, counseling. Now, while I give you that comprehensive picture of the types of services that you'll find in the education um, environment, that is not in all communities. And so there's an emerging need throughout our county. I'll go ahead and stop right there. Thank you. Anybody else want to jump in on that particular question? All right. Before I ask Veronica her question, I think I neglected to mention to you when I was talking about Veronica and her accomplishments that she's currently serving as the director of our El Dorado Community Health Center. And I think that's very, very important because she brings such a wealth of experience and knowledge and commitment to us. And we are lucky enough to have her here at our community health center. So, Veronica. In your workplace, do you identify adults who are in poverty? If so, for what purpose and what programs and services are available for them? Yeah, so I just want to say that you're inviting me to come. You're better. So I just wanted to say uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm you know, I've been in El Dorado County for about six years now. Um, most of my experience in healthcare, you know, has been more in urban settings. So this was something that was different for me, even though I grew up in a, you know, semi-rural agricultural community down in uh, the southern uh, Monterey County area. Um, I, I wanted to say a little bit about my background just before I answer the question. Of, my mission has always been to work with underserved communities. Um, so I did my training at San Francisco uh, General Hospital. Uh, I worked a little bit in Sacramento County and worked with the uh, medically indigent population there. And then um, started working for the Community Health Center in um, Placerville. And I just wanted to describe to you what, what the difference is um, between a community health center you know, it's not a clinic, it's not a private doctor's office, we're a nonprofit organization. Um, so we provide different types of services. It's not just, you know, diagnosis and treatment. It really encompasses uh, social issues, uh, behavioral health, uh, mental health, um, <coughs> all of those things. And so, you know, patients don't really identify themselves to us as being poor. Uh, most of the time we discover that through circumstances. Uh, you ask them to return because they have a condition that requires, you know, quick follow-up and they tell you, well, I don't know if I can come back because I, I have to, uh, <laughs> I don't have enough uh, money to pay for gas and I'm living in my car and I can winter and I need to keep it on to stay warm. Um, those types of things. Um, in our health center we have a, an entire department dedicated to helping individuals who are going through difficult times. It's, it's limited. We call it patient assistance program um, where we have a budget designated to help families um, you know when they're having difficulty accessing food, uh, transportation, um, clothing, um, and it's always amazing. I mean, 
I can give you an example of something that stood out to me. Uh, even till now, I, I saw a newborn baby that was two and a half weeks, almost three weeks, who came in um, and was not back at its birth weight and also came with a fever. Uh, when you have a newborn with a fever, you need to admit them to the hospital and figure out why they have a fever. Um, so we told the mom, I told the mom that we needed to send the baby to the hospital, um, but we needed to send them to Sacramento where they're more uh, equipped to deal with newborns. And so she said her husband was available to drive them, but then she said her husband was not comfortable driving to Sacramento because he didn't have a license. So then we had to call the, you know, the ambulance, uh, to take them, and then later we got our patient services department involved uh, in the idea why is this baby not, not gaining weight? And apparently the, the husband or the father had just lost his job. Their um, power, they had no water or um, you know heat, so they were uh, cooking outside in their uh, grill. And I guess the mom felt that she didn't want to feed the baby too often because she felt that um, because she wasn't feeling good, uh, she was stressed, she didn't want to feed the baby bad milk. So it just kind of tells you there's so much, uh, so much that we don't know that you wouldn't realize unless the baby hadn't presented with the uh, you know, fever and failure to drive, and you said, well, we need to admit them, but you wouldn't have learned all of these things. And so that's just kind of an example of how, you know, how sometimes we just don't know. It's really hard to know. Um, and our, our staff, too, our medical assistants, our support staff, sometimes they, they interact with patients and they identify, well, this family's homeless, and I'm always amazed at how, um, their commitment, their dedication, and they amongst themselves will, you know, donate things to this particular family because they're homeless, and it's 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 a good place to work. I'm always amazed at the kind of work, the people that I get to work with. So, other comments from panelists? So I waited to, to respond uh, because I think the answer for the court system is similar uh, irrespective of whether the person is a child or an adult. But before I get to the answer, like my colleagues before me, I appreciate that you included me in this really important forum. I can't and hear you. Yeah, you can't hear you. Get it closer. Just get closer. Closer. I need to get closer. I need to get really close, actually. So I was saying that I waited to answer the question until, because I could answer children and adults more concisely and split it up. But before I answer the question, I, like my colleagues before me, want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for including me, but more importantly, thank you for having the forum at all. This is. The more I thought about this issue, the more I realized that it's critical to all the other issues that I'm working on. But I get really focused on the issue I'm working on, and uh, that's too bad. Because if we could figure out how to deal with poverty, we would make such incredible strides um, that I think the quality of life for everybody would be much improved. I also want to tell you that um, and this is mostly for context, that I'm here representing the court at some level because that's my profession. However, I also grew up in poverty. My story is not dissimilar to Tiffany's. And uh, I stole food. Actually, those free school lunches, I used to like to take an extra one or two because, you know, it was food. <laughs> I always thought it was funny that I was getting in trouble for that, by the way. Um, so when I answer these questions, I will be answering them from both perspectives, that is, from my professional
professional perspective and also from our personal experiences. So as it relates to these questions, that is, have you identified children and or adults in poverty in the workplace, the court system frankly doesn't do that good job of it. We have a system in place for fee waivers for people who are not able to afford the fees. Apparently it's too close now. <laughs> for people that are not able to pay the fees, but unfortunately that doesn't always address the, the rest of the issues. So, um, you know, for example, because the judiciary's budget has been cut basically in half in the last five years, there have been courts that have been closed down all over the state. So if you live in San Bernardino County right now, you, you may have to travel over 100 miles to even file the paperwork. So the fact that they'll let you file it for free is not all that helpful if you can't get there. Um, similarly, you can get a fee waiver for having the documentation file, but you don't get a fee waiver to have the documentation served on somebody. And if you don't serve the documentation, then the court doesn't have jurisdiction to hear the matter. So um, the issue is is definitely impacting the court system. But we have these subcommittees on access to justice, and I always kind of laugh because um, the first things that they usually talk about are language barriers, which of course are important, or cultural barriers, which are important. But my thought is always, well, what about poor people? And um, it's not that that is not considered, it just doesn't seem to be prioritized. As it relates to children, uh, similarly, I think, to both of your professions, we have a whole section in the courts called juvenile court, but when we come in contact with juveniles that are impoverished, it's because they're in trouble. Either they've committed crimes, or they are part of a family that's been identified as being abusive. And so then we learn about the poverty through what we call as a case plan, where we are setting up plans to try and reunite families, or to try and help families have their children not be in trouble. And then these issues of poverty become really important and difficult barriers to resolve. So I have a CPS calendar as, as your commissioner for the previous three years, and I was in South Lake Tahoe, and uh, there were children that would be removed because they were not accessing medical care or dental care, and so their children would be suffering, their children would be in class with these huge abscesses in their mouths because, um, because they hadn't taken them to a dentist. And it's really easy you know, to wag the judicial finger and say, shame on you that you're not giving your kids the health care they need, but the truth is there's, there's nobody in South Lake Tahoe who takes Medi-Cal for dental services for kids. So, so how, what do you say to a family who needs to take care of this and now the situation is so severe that they're probably gonna have to go all the way to Sacramento instead of Placerville to get it resolved and there's no transportation to get them there. There's no money for them to pay to eat while they are making this journey. And I would just say, uh, growing up poor, the journeys, um, actually I went to the dentist once as a child. The second time I went to the dentist, I was in college, and uh, they were amazed that I hadn't been to a dentist. But for a family that's poor, to go 60 miles away, 80 miles away, it's really hard to describe if you haven't lived through it how many different steps are involved and how many different obstacles are involved in simply making a 60 mile trip to the dentist. So I think we'll leave it at that. I think, um, you know, when I think about poverty in rural areas, there are multiple stressors that are impacting 
children and families. But you know, even though I've been engaged in working with uh, children and families in poverty for you know, 20 plus years, there are moments such as, uh, I'd say it was approximately four weeks ago, and I'm, I'm just sharing this just more from an empathy standpoint, where I was in my car and um, I received a call from my wife. And again, this is just approximately four weeks ago. And my wife, Deanne, says, Nina and I, Nina is my 16-year-old daughter who actually just got her driver's license. We were turning left in an intersection and um, there was an elderly woman who went through the red light and just, you know, hit the side of my, uh, my daughter and my wife's car. And my wife was just in panic because she could not get out of the car. It was just smashed. And it was interesting to me because I feel like, you know, we're stable professionals, uh, but how quickly with an, an acute stressor, it's difficult just to focus at work. Uh, just the challenges that you need to navigate even when you have insurance. Um, the, just the challenge of driving and then thinking about your family members or even yourself, if that could happen again. And you all understand in what short-term stressors are. The complexity of systemic and challenging stressors around families who are in rural poverty are magnified well beyond what I'm describing. So issues of transportation, and Dylan, you did a great job just giving specific examples of just what it takes to uh, with the overcome a, you know, what it would mean to get 60 miles to a dentist, let alone the cost of the gas to do that. Employment opportunities are challenging. I was speaking with a superintendent this morning on the phone, reached out personally to say I've got two mothers who are dealing with a child custody issue. It's very difficult. They want to keep their children. The dilemma is that the, the, the fathers uh, who want to take the children um, have a case because they are the primary uh, support financially. These women want to get a job. They can't because of it just um, employment challenges and transportation challenges. Yeah, that's just this morning. Um, accessible to affordable childcare is another prevailing issue. Um, just navigating the system. In the educational world, it is not uncommon that families that are dealing with poverty were not successful uh, in school themselves. And so there's just an intimidation factor that occurs. And last, I would say, um, it's just, it's very difficult and you do not have a sense of hope. It's very difficult to live in rural poverty and not have a sense of hope. Does anyone else want to jump in on that one at this point in time? Dylan, go ahead. I'm trying hard not to fight with my mind. Is it working now? Yes. Uh, great, okay. Um, I would just add, and I appreciate what Ed just said about hope. Um, I would just add that that poverty and abuse uh, go hand in hand, and also they don't. And so I think that um, part of the barriers are if you are child who's impoverished is just the shame factor. So it's kind of the opposite of hope. It's not just that you don't have hope. It's that you're embarrassed. And you're the kid who's wearing the same clothes every day. You can see that you stand out when you're in school. And so if there's not a value on school and you stand out in school in a negative way, then why would you want to go to school? Um, I think that uh, the, I think that there's a completely different value system going on, and it may be a product of not having the financial means to have the same value system, but as time goes on, that gets reinforced. So things that, that most people in this room would think are exactly what everyone should have, 
like everyone should go get a checkup every year, right? All kids should, all adults should. Everybody should go to the dentist, everybody should eat, everybody should have a sufficient amount of clothes, everybody should have shelter. Uh, it's not a given when you're dealing with folks who have been impoverished that that is their value system. And so one of the barriers is uh, that you're talking to somebody who's got a different value system than you do and may have different, different priorities than you do. And so they may have completely different ideas about how to spend this limited amount of resource that you're going to provide for them um, than you do. And so then there's this, uh, condescending, this condescending piece to it, whether it's actually condescending or not, that the person who's receiving the help uh, may be experiencing. And so then that reinforces that people that are impoverished are somehow stupid or don't deserve the help or whatever. And so I think that part of the barriers are just that uh, we're talking a different language and have different value systems and we've got to figure out how to find the commonality so that the help can be received and help them together. So let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about collaboration and systems, whether they do or don't collaborate. And I know that Dylan has some opinions about how the judicial system does or does not collaborate. And I have a feeling that we probably have some other um, comments from our other panelists on that very issue. So Dylan, if you want to start us off, and then I think we can probably get some other sense about some other systems as well. All right, so in the court system, uh, this is a small enough county that you all, I'm sure, know Judge Kingsbury, and uh, she's mentored me and basically <laughs> given me license to collaborate, to have the courts be more of a lead, play more of a leadership role in the community and collaborate. So when I was on the juvenile bench, I worked really diligently with my uh, partners in the community to find better ways to deliver services to uh, families who are part of the CPS system. And now I've been working on criminal justice realignment and uh, working really diligently with probation and a sheriff and a DA and a public defender and so on. And so I was thinking, wow, the court's a great collaborator. And then I started thinking about the issue, issue and thought, oh, we don't collaborate at all. <laughs> How sad is that? And if I think about those two systems that I one worked on really diligently, uh, that is child welfare, and now the shift in focus to criminal justice realignment. When I look at the core issues for the people that we're serving in both instances, that is uh, impoverished children and children of abuse and uh, criminals and mostly how do we deal with recurrent crime. One of the biggest issues, if I were to look at it from a higher level, is poverty, right? And so I'm sad to say that I don't think we're doing a very good job of collaborating as it relates to the specific issue of poverty. However, we'd like to. <laughs> if I'm still being tapped as a collaborator, I'm there with you. Other thoughts? Yeah, well, um, as I was listening, listening to the women next to me, you know, thinking about, I guess, barriers and how do you get out of poverty, I mean, the problem is so hard. It's almost like you have to have some luck uh, along with it. It's not like there's a system in place that helps you get out of poverty, especially if you have uh, a young person or a child whose self-esteem is so low. Um, you know, just like they were talking about, just having this shame, being embarrassed of, of who you are, and having no one to tell you that you're special, that you have talent, that you have a gift, that you have a purpose in the world. So how how do you give that to a young person? How do they receive that? And for me, I, I think that in education, for a lot of kids, their first role model, their first safe place is in the classroom or a teacher that lets them know that they are smart, they are special, and so sometimes, if 
can have a kid who will grab onto that and who says, I don't want to continue the cycle that you know my parents, that my community <coughs> has continued and, and goes with it. But then you have to have no distractors. Uh, and for teenagers, there's tons of distractors. Um, so, I mean, I don't know exactly they're, you know, the women here, how they got to where they are. Um, for me, I, I'm the first person in my family who, who uh, you know, uh, went to college, uh, let alone even higher education. And so I, I lived in a community where all of my friends were, you know, becoming teenage mothers. And um, I, I don't know, people always said I was an old soul because I was always um, telling my friends who were planning to run away with their boyfriends, like, don't do it, you know, like, if he really loves you, he'll wait for you, you know, those types of, of things. But for me, I, I had this goal in mind that I needed to get out of the community that I lived in because it, it just didn't really lead to anything good. And so I, in many ways, I was very lonely in high school because all my friends were out partying and uh, ditching class and I had a goal in mind. And so I had to <laughs> go take my exams and I had a chemistry physics teacher who saw a talent in me and said, well, are you gonna apply to college? Why don't you bring your personal statement? You know, I'll, I'll, and he reviewed it and gave me advice and, and that's kind of, start where I went but um, if you don't have any role models in your in your life or someone guiding you it's, it's difficult let alone when you're living in a, a household of abuse or where you're not getting enough food to eat um, you're not receiving clean clothing a, a loving environment I mean I didn't have any of what they had I had two like very loving parents I mean we didn't have a lot but I always had enough food to eat. I just didn't have, you know, guidance in terms of higher education. So I, I just see it as how you provide these kids. It's almost like if you're born into a certain environment, it's, you're already um, behind. So I, I don't have any solutions. I'm sorry, but. Well, but that is a very, excellent segue into our next question, which is, what has your profession taught you about poverty? And I know that Ed has some opinions about that, and it's consistent, and um, perhaps um, he, it's consistent with what we've already heard, and probably another few thoughts, Ed? So, uh, first of all, Veronica, you are talking about your school experience. You know, I've been um, in schools where they've been predominantly or in terms of uh, the student population, but students like yourself, you know, if the system is affirming uh, excellence and high expectations, you would have been a rock star in our school. So I just want to let you know that you would have been the role model. So with that said, I think one thing I've learned is understanding and empathy goes a long way. You know, we're talking about challenging issues, and so just, you know, we talk about poverty, and we're hearing the statistics or the stories, start formulating you know, our thoughts and assumptions behind it. But when you're actually engaged with children and families who happen to be in poverty and you're in a posture of understanding, uh, I think that's the first thing that's important. Francie Hein was uh, assisting me when I was actually a principal in a high poverty school. And she was assisting us on a, on a kind of financial um, side of our educational system. I think probably within the first hour that I met you, Francie, I said, um, I want you to come into my classroom. I was a principal that I taught. And I wanted her to meet the children. And I wanted her to hear their hopes, their aspirations. Because again, I just wanted her to understand the community that I wanted her to assist. So this panel can be you know, we can express all that we want. But what I've learned, you easily can have us just go outside the door and line up like 10 parents who happen to be in poverty, right? We wouldn't say they're in poverty, just line up these mothers, 
fathers, family members, and say, what's your dream for your children here in El Dorado County in school? You just listen to them. Okay? They're going to have dreams. And you kind of move them aside. You bring 10 children anywhere from elementary school, middle school, high school, or maybe one who's struggling. What are your dreams? What do you aspire to? That would galvanize us. We would understand how we want to invest our time, our commitment, our mission. So my point is, what I've learned in working in the field of education, understanding the children and families goes a long way when you're strategically looking how to invest your time, talents, and resources. to share with us your experiences. Can you help us better understand what services were available to you, what services you were able to take advantage of, and let us get a sense of that. Um, you know, it's, was, it's been an amazing journey to share with you this way tonight, because from, it, you know, I was going to jump in uh, to the comments that Ed and, and Dylan were making about, and Veronica about, um, the, the cultural divide and the two worlds. It is it is two worlds. It is, I mean, I'm a diet master, and being poor is like being underwater, and having enough is like having air, and they're not the same. And so when you're poor and you are covering, you know, in the wild, animals have a way of always compensating on their appearance. They do not want to look weak. They do not want to fall behind. They do not want to, you know, birds will not allow their feathers to be ruffled. Animals will just keep going until they fall. We were just talking about this over dinner. Because they do not want to look weak because they will get picked off. And so when you're poor and you're compensating and you're covering, you don't want to get picked off. So you don't access, you don't ask, you don't act as if you're poor. You just, in my family, we didn't want other people to notice. You know, we were very proud, uh, intellectually superior, had a lot of grandiosity going on. And um, we did not want anybody to know, so no, we did not access. I have no idea what sort of resources might have been available. We didn't access them. So the answer to that was, I do not know. <laughs> um, I do know some of the services that we access, but it was usually because I felt humiliated by whatever the situation was. So uh, one service that my family accessed was food closets. And, um, you know, first of all, I was blessed to be a good athlete as a young person. So that helped me integrate because people wanted me on their team. Uh, so we would be waiting in the food closet line and then some of my teammates would go by and then I would be completely humiliated. And, uh, you know, likewise, food stamps at the grocery store, uh, the grocery store was an outing, big outing, when I was a kid because it was about a mile and a half away in the car. Uh, so my mom had one of those little, my mom uh, had me when she was 19. So as I got older, you know, we weren't that, she was obviously young. So she had one of those uh, little lady uh, carts to get all the food on. And I was the oldest, so I was kind of designated father of the family, despite the fact that I was a girl and obviously uh, not a father. <laughs> and, and so I would, as soon as I was large enough, I would go and then carry all the food for my mom. So we would be in line, and invariably there would be some teammate of mine or somebody from school who was also in the line when the food stamps came out. And I would just be like, oh my gosh. And the, the, this is in the 70s, I was born in the 60s, so this is in the 70s, and you know, people in line would just be saying these awful things. I mean, uh, the amount of discrimination that has been imparted towards me, and I fall into different isms, as some of you know, uh, it certainly wasn't because I was a woman, I wouldn't put that as on the top of the list. I wouldn't put my sexual orientation on the top of the list of discrimination I've experienced. I would put poverty at the top of the list by far. 
So, yeah, I mean, we had Medi-Cal. I, I know that we had that because when I got hurt, I would take myself to the doctor and, the, you know, they'd pull those little stickers off mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it was all like so overt that so there was, it wasn't very easy to cover, which was hard. But maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe part of the problem and what we should be thinking about in terms of solutions is how do we make it okay to talk about being impoverished? So, um, and also, I noticed that some of you are starting to look sad or discouraged. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I was just saying, like, you, you, have, uh, you have people up here who have, who be poverty, right? right? Yeah. So, this can be solved. And an organization like yours being willing to even talk about it is huge. So don't get don't get sad. Don't get depressed. I mean, you know, frankly, that's great to have emotions. Deal with that with your spouses when you get home. Right now, it's like that's <laughs> poverty uh, by domestic violence. So I would just say that you can get to poverty in different ways, right? You can be born into it, which I think is common on this stage. Uh, you can be a victim of domestic violence and leave that situation and then end up in a situation where you become impoverished. You can become impoverished because uh, the business you were running went belly up and now you don't have that. Uh, so I just, want to make sure that we're thinking about it from different vantage points. But I have a good friend, a really good friend, who entered into poverty as an adult, as she was a victim of domestic violence, she has two boys. So I talked to her about it because I wanted to get her perspective before I came. And so, you know, being in Elder Rock County, the transportation thing just, I just always go back to transportation. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, come on, Dylan. I mean, you know, I'm an attractive woman. I could always bum a rack. But I'm just not going to leave my kids with anybody. So when you were talking about affordable uh, child care, what I thought is it's never affordable. I mean, if you're impoverished, you're not talking about I'm going to pay for child care. That's not even part of the thought process. The thought process is which of these neighbors of mine is not going to be high, which one's not going to molest my kids, you know, which of these neighbors who can I leave my kids with for a couple hours so that I can go deal with something or so that I can access the services that, and, and opportunities that you want to provide. So I would just say that childcare has got to be really at the top of the list of barriers and also something that I think is pretty solvable. I mean, it is something that we, there's, I don't know how many people are in this room, but if, if we had 10 conversations about it, we find 10 solutions, right? And three of them would be viable. So, so Veronica, we've been talking about reasons for poverty. We've been talking about identifying poverty. And so, from your perspective, what other kinds of things should we be alert to as we're thinking about Women's Fund El Dorado and what it is we can do? You know, my, my perspective is always on, you know, health care needs and, you know, we inevitably, you know, and I tell our provider group that patients uh, many times are not treated equally um, because we still have a significant number of people who have no insurance who cannot qualify for any insurance product. And so a lot of the preventative health measures that are recommended do not apply to them. You know, we try the best that we can. Uh, for example, for women's health, we 
We do have a cancer detection program so that all women, regardless of whether they have insurance or not, um, they can get you know, uh, breast cancer screening. Um, but other uh, preventative measures like colon cancer screening, um, we can recommend it to all our patients, but that doesn't mean that they're gonna go um, get that done. Um, or cancer patients, if you have no insurance, if you have, and you have cancer, I mean, they're, you're done. There's, there's no way out of it. Um, there's so many things that are preventable, and um, that, it really makes you so help, helpless because you, uh, you enter this field because you want to help people and then you get there and you really can't. So even people in kidney disease, kidney disease is renal failure. Um, a lot of patients who could have gotten preventative uh, help there before they got into renal failure if they don't have insurance and you can't access that. Um, dental. Dental services is a huge one for, even for patients who have insurance, uh, if their plan doesn't cover dental care, um, it's, it's tough. Or, um, or maybe there's no providers, no dental providers or no specialists who take a, a certain uh, insurance product. You know, the majority of our patients are um, Medi-Cal uh, recipients. We also have with private insurance and Medicare, but um, sometimes those services are really hard to get. It's not that, that we don't have specialists in the area, it's just that they, they don't take that insurance product. And transportation, I mean, we deal with this on a daily basis. Um, sometimes they need to travel to San Francisco. UCSF is the only specialist, you know, who will take your insurance and trying to get them there is a hardship. Um, yeah, so you know we're we're constantly trying to figure things out, trying to do the best we can, and you know gathering resources to help all our patients and not just some of our patients. Um, so. You know, we, we're, a, we're a safety net provider and uh, our mission is to take care of everyone regardless of their ability to pay. Um, but sometimes uh, when you, we can take care of things inside the four walls, but when it comes to specialty services, it can become a, a challenge. Um, Other thoughts on that So, um, excuse my phone, I'm not actually texting my friends. Uh, I took some notes on my phone. I mean, first of all, I think, and I've said this a couple times, but I think the first thing is to talk about it. The first thing is to create the conversation. And in creating that conversation, um, I think that the Women's Fund could be proactive about identifying the myths of poverty or uh, you know, common reasons why people are discriminated against related to their poverty and uh, make a commitment to continue to talk about it. And you know, that might be underwhelming, but as I look across this room, I don't know, there's two, between two and 300 people here, what I would guess. Uh, so, if everybody in this room committed to talking to five other people about this, then that would be between 1,000 and 1,500 people in our little county who are now thinking about it. And inevitably, some of them would talk to other people, and we would actually start a conversation. I mean, a real conversation. And um, I, th I think that you, I, I know, about your model, um, it's a great model. Could talk about that for a long time, but that'd be a tangent. 
So your model is a great model, but I would consider taking some of the grant money that you would grant to an organization to do a thing, and instead uh, do a, and uh, I'm sorry that I'm gonna use the bad word marketing, I was joking around with your marketing director about this earlier. <laughs> do a communications campaign. You know, we have this crazy thing called the internet, where instead of talking to a thousand or fifteen hundred people, we could be talking to tens of thousands of people about this issue. You know, you could do um, you could do the campaign where we put the signs at all the bus stops if we don't have any. But which get my point, right? But which which get my point? Which is. Whoever was offended by that, I'm sorry, but I was just trying to put an emphasis on the transportation issue. <laughs> but, but my point is, it's one thing to talk about it, and it's a whole other thing to really uh, use something that you already have in-house, which are marketing specialists, to try and frame how to talk about it, and how to pick up a couple issues and really talk about it, and put a campaign out there to talk about it, and I suspect that you could get partners to do that. You could get the food bank to partner with you. You could get the foundation to partner with you. You could get some healthcare folks to partner with you. You could do something at the schools, right? You could do something at the courts. I would be happy to help. So uh, I would just ask you to consider looking at it collaboratively. Thank you. Uh, from 30,000 feet instead of in the trenches, which I don't want anybody here to think that I'm saying that you guys donating and I actually belong to you. In the trenches is a bad thing, it's a great thing. But on this particular issue, I think it needs a bigger picture. It, it needs a big picture effort. And I understand that each year there's a different topic, but I would challenge you to think about poverty over a period of years, which doesn't necessarily mean um, that you're not gonna do anything else. But if you're gonna make a commitment to, to making a difference in this issue, it's not a one-year project. In, in my mind, there has to be forums like this that occur in other places besides the women's forum. We've gotta figure out how to get business leaders to come talk about this. I mean, one thing that we didn't talk about is the living wage. So I'm sorry that I forgot to say that when we were on the negatives, but while we're on the positives, <laughs> while we're in the positives, we have great business leaders in this community, right? right. It's, it's to their advantage to have workers who can actually feed their kids. That, that's actually to their advantage because that parent's not gonna be stressed out the whole time that they're at work. They're gonna be more focused on the work. It's for whose business leaders because their employees will be there on time because they'll have some way to pay for the gas for the person that they're gonna bother the ride from. Um, you, you know, I think that a subcommittee thinking about how to frame this up and doing a educational campaign over say a three or five year period would really change the way people talk about poverty in this county. And one last point about poverty in this county. I lived in Sacramento County for 25 years Thank you all for uh, welcoming me into your county. I love it here, it's fantastic, I feel very privileged. But let me tell you the perspective of Sacramento County. They think El Dorado County is rich. This is the place that everybody wants to move to if you live in Sacramento County. They want to move to El Dorado Hills, right? It's the nicest suburb of Sacramento. It is. That's how people from Sacramento think about El Dorado County, is I'm gonna vacation in South Lake Tahoe, Right? Where they perceive that there's money, despite the fact that there isn't any. <laughs> and I want to live in El Dorado Hills when I make it. Okay, so let's just imagine for a second that we take El Dorado Hills out of our county, which I don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> but if we took El Dorado Hills out of our county, and then we looked at El Dorado County, and we talked about poverty, then what would people outside think? Then they would see the reality of poverty in this county which is, it's a real problem in this county. So, that's a few things to think about. I know Ed, you can still do what you want to say.
I just, uh, it's interesting to when you're speaking, I just step back and reflect, you know. Uh, but I, I think that uh, when you look at the context of El Dorado County, you know, just stepping back, you know, my, uh, my family will take this trip um, each year and we'll spend about 10 days in Guatemala. And we, we volunteer in an organization that seeks to break cycles of poverty. And they've been in, they've impacted thousands of children and, and families over uh, the 20 year period that uh, I've been aware of it. And then I come back and, and I think about all the complexities of a third world country or even the complexities of an, an urban county. Um, but I will drive, you know, when I'm driving throughout the county, there will be times I'll, I'll, I'll call my uh, brother and sister-in-law who, who live in the county, and so does my mother-in-law, and I'll say, how wonderful it is that each day, each week, each year, I could be contributing to the education system of my nieces, Allie, Audrey, Erin, Anna, Kate, and Ainsley. And I just have this absolute commitment to them. But I, when I think of um, the challenges of poverty, it really is, goes back to what you were saying, you know, it, it's, it's a, co a commitment that we need to make to really look at. And while there could be the commitment to dialogue about it, there is a bold way of thinking, and this is what I appreciated coming here today was, let's break it. There is, there is these times where I sit back and I'll drive through the county and I think, this is the type of county that can eliminate poverty. Like, I, I feel that because of the, the level of influence, but the challenges are great. So I just want to, again, um, acknowledge my appreciation for the topic, and it's complex, and while the grants are good, there's just a, a level of knowledge and network in this room that can move other systems that are impacting hundreds of children. Other comments on that particular um, and Kathy, I'm going to take the liberty of doing a segue between their bold thinking um, and the next question on the list that I have, which is, um, you know, how to define and implement a long-term process or path, basically a, a, a way of transformation that is real when it comes to how to deal with poverty. And, um, you know, Dylan, I just love you. I love her tonight. She's my new best friend. <laughs> Because you get in trouble, huh? And then I'm a little bit of trouble in my life. <laughs> so, you know, we're rebels, and there's nothing worse than, uh, than powerful women that know what the heck they're talking about, that are getting together to do good stuff. And, um, you know, this is just so fun to be up here doing this with y'all. Um, the, the, the truth of what it takes to get out is that it is a multidisciplinary, multi-generational, multi-faceted, uh, it is a 360 degree problem and it requires a 360 degree solution. It is a lifelong recovery trip because if you're born into it and you have been you know, bred in that air and you've been fed that water, it is in you and it never leaves. It never leaves. I mean, I'm 51 years old. I stopped struggling with financial poverty when I was in my 20s. And it's only really now, in this past five years or so, that I have really, really overcome, and I still struggle, with the early origins of the fear and anxiety and the deep trauma and the knowledge of it can get worse and the feeling of not enough. And also, you know, we have to talk about the social aspects of what do you do when you have to leave your loved ones behind? Because you have to. To escape, this is real. It is understood in, you know, in, in poor neighborhoods, in poor families. You know, kids that try to do well in school, they get trashed because you're trying, you think you're better than I am and you're trying to get out. Who do you think you are? You think you're better than I am? Well, let me just show you. And I'm telling you, I have friends that are you know, family that is, they're, they're on their they're wreckage on the battlefield because they lost and I had to leave them behind. And it's real and it's painful. How do you ask a kid to let go of their parent when their parent can't come along with them on the road to getting out of poverty? The parent won't leave and the kid wants to. What does the kid do? So, um, you know, I, I have a question here that's about how to, 
you know, I'm a change management expert. I love process. I love organizational transformation. I love being able to get in and just work out a plan because I came from poverty. I'm a control freak. And, um, you know, just tell me what to do. We can get it done. And um, it's real that you have to be able to create a system. And what I really love about the things that I've experienced is that by being willing to reach out and take action in order to say, this isn't good enough for me, I want more, and then taking action. The action itself generates momentum, and it generates energy that other people can see and respond to. And so in coming up with a real, you know, a real solution, we need to bring in multifaceted, uh, you know, big thinkers, little thinkers, people that can mentor, people that just can hang out and, you know, be, create community. You know, we've got life skills in here, we've got amazing people in here, decades and decades of success. We can leverage what's in this room and turn it into a fireball. I mean, we don't have to pay money in order to help solve this. We're here, we can help solve this. So, um, you know, I, I really want to talk to every one of you, your hearts, and say, have I made it past, have I made it through and overcome adversity? And what do I have to offer? to someone who's trying to get out. Because we find the willing, we work with the willing, and the willing then start generating their own power, and they begin to have that ripple effect in their own communities, in their own families, in their own lives, and it takes on this amazing momentum, and it's real. I've seen it, I know it, you create community, and it works. So, um, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> talked all around it because we inherently know it's true, but the answer is children. So I know that's obvious, but piggybacking off what Tiffany just said, it just seems like it should be so easy. We've got them at school, we could provide all the services they need at school, um, but if you don't address the issues of socialization, the mental health issues that are likely part of the uh, issue with their parents, that, and by the way, if you grow up with somebody who has mental health issues and you yourself don't, you're still being, the environment that you're living in is somebody who has mental health issues. And so you learn all of these horrible coping skills because your person that you emulate has all these horrible coping skills. So the point about that is it has to be comprehensive. Um, you know, you can, the answer to the question of if you're the kid who wants to get out and you can't bring your family with you, the only actual answer is to get out, which means you do leave your family behind, which means you've got kids that are young people who may be able to get in college. Then you put them into college and they have no idea how to behave in, in normalized, socialized uh, activity. So I, I don't think the problem is getting to the children that need help. I think that that the answer is thinking it through well enough to have it be comprehensive enough that we don't leave some piece dangling that then 10 years later, 20 years later, when we see that person and they're impoverished and or drug addict and or with serious mental health issues, we think, oh my gosh, we failed. Uh, not everybody will come along but let's make sure that we, the people that we ask to come along, that we actually give them a full philanthropy of support that they need. Thank you. So, so rather than continue to stand and try to 
shout. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Another question. I just want to thank this panel for giving us so much to think about, and, and I hope it leads to wonderful things in this county. I'm sure it will, and thank you for that comment. And if we have some questions from the audience, we can answer. We'll do that, and then we'll do a wrap up. And thank you for giving um, that part. That's helpful. So we're going to try to take two of these questions. If the questions that we take are not your questions, then as I said earlier, if you'd like to stay after we adjourn, I'm sure our panelists would be more than willing to talk with you. So here's a question for our panel. Speaking to programs and services available, are there any for people in poverty to treat addiction? It seems there are programs for criminals, but no programs for people who can't afford it and if they, in fact, want it. So we're talking about programs to treat addiction. Veronica, it looks like you have a thought. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a huge need in our county. I guess it depends on what addiction, what specific addiction you're talking about, whether it's alcohol or... Um, you know, opioid addiction. Um, yeah, I, you know, in, in our health center, we, we do have a physician who is uh, certified to provide uh, opioid addiction uh, treatment, which is with uh, something called buprenorphine and suboxone. So and we have a pretty comprehensive program there in terms of integrated with uh, therapy because. Um, the uh, treatment doesn't work if you don't work on the behavior changes that are needed for that individual to work on uh, to, you know, get off some of the, um, these medications that, are, that they're addicted to. But very limited. Yeah, I mean, we struggle. I mean, we have patients who say, you know, they've got alcohol problems and they want to go into an inpatient detox because they feel that's what's going to work best for them. And, we don't know where to send them. We'll spend time talking to their insurance, the insurance company, and they said, well, that's something that your county mental health program should provide, but they really don't. And so it's, it's, it's a huge need. So Dylan, I'm, I'm gonna cut you off because we're gonna try to manage within the time. Um, we have one more question that we'd like to take. And then um, we'd love to have you so thank you, be just one minute. Um, the question that we haven't yet addressed is how is poverty different for the elderly? We've talked a lot about the working population, we've talked a lot about children. How is it different for the elderly? Yeah, you know, I think for the elderly, it's, you know, some of the patients we see, you're always wondering, how well they're taking care of at home. You're always wondering, should I be calling CPS? Not CPS, I'm sorry, Adult Protective Services, because you know they have serious um, chronic medical conditions and they don't come to their appointments and a lot of times they're dependent on their family members to bring them. You know, they're, you know, it's almost like children. You know, if their parents don't bring them in, and we really can't help them. So there's a lot of uh, dependency uh, on some of, from some of our uh, frail elderly that um, also have a lot of mental health issues and um, areas of neglect uh, that sometimes we don't know what to do about. Them. Other thoughts? So Dylan, you had a comment about our previous question. I'm sorry, to yeah, Actually, I do have just one quick comment about elderly poverty. Um, you know, from a personal perspective, um, 
a significant part of my family culture is that my the women in my family died before they were 60. They died alone, they died in poverty, and they died with their cats. Um, and after living that way, the hopelessness is so overwhelming that my what I saw was they just they just kind of just die. They just kind of die because the hope is gone and there's they just sort of wing out. That's it. Thank you. So on that one on the the last question was are there services for non criminals to deal with addiction? Right. Uh, so I have a lot of knowledge about this because I work with pro board, so the knowledge is based in criminality, but I think it applies across lines, which is there's new research out there that shows that 76% of addicts have mental health issues. So uh, what I see is anybody can go to an AA or an NA meeting, um, although the effectiveness is not very good if you don't have mental health services connected to it. Now, likewise, you can access substance abuse treatment programs if you uh, end up in a CPS situation. It's going to be part of your case plan. 80% uh, of CPS cases involve drug addiction. 50% of CPS cases involve domestic violence. So there's, you can see the overlap there. Uh, so there's huge services involved from the Department of Health and Human Services if you end up in that situation. The problem with both of those examples that I just gave is you're going to be in programs with criminals. And so uh, it may have some positive effect, but it also may have some negative effect. Because if you're impoverished and you're struggling, and then you hang out with criminals, uh, I think the I think the, end, the connection is pretty obvious. Uh, so, what I would say as it relates to access for people that aren't criminals is we, for addiction is that we need to stop pretending that these are separate issues and recognize that three quarters of the time, if the person has drug dependence or drug addiction, they also have mental health issues. So if we would work on our mental health issue problem in El Dorado County, which could be a whole nother forum, and I'm sure you have a lot of that. <laughs> right? I mean, in this room, we don't have to talk, we don't have to get to the point where we all recognize that we basically don't have that, unless you've got a razor blade in your hand and you're ready to commit suicide. There are no emergent mental health services in this county, and even for criminals, and those folks involved in a CPS situation, they may have health they may have mental health services during that period of time, but the minute they walk away from that, there's no way to re-enter into mental health services. Uh, so, you know, if I put child care really high on the list, I would put mental health also really high on the list. And uh, if, if we were simultaneously tackling mental health, which again, would pull last year into this year, uh, then we'd be making some long-term progress, so. So, Ed, I know you have a Just a closing thought in respect to education and poverty. I think, uh, you know, regardless of the class, um, and what, what we see, even in discussions with superintendents throughout the county, is just this desire to ensure that all kids excel, and the expectations are high for all kids. So if there are 4.0 straight A student, regardless of the class level they're in, um, or if they're a struggling student, the expectations remain high. And yes, while we want the instruction and uh, curriculum to be strong in the schools, we recognize that there are barriers, and the school system is a very safe place uh, for children and families, and it's a, it's a place to identify where those barriers are and then knock them down. But again, it's uh, just, I, I think, um, in listening to school leaders throughout this county, their, their dreams and aspirations and goals for their students remain high. So with that, I'd like us to take a minute and reflect upon this past 
hour and a half. And what we have learned is that yes, poverty does exist in El Dorado County. As a matter of fact, statistically about 12% of our population is labeled living in poverty. We also know inherently and just in our gut that the number is probably significantly higher than that. We know that in the state of California, 23% statistically are living in poverty. We also know that in the United States, there's 16%. So in fact, from our perspective, no percent of poverty is acceptable. And then the question becomes, what can we do about it? And we've heard from our panelists that it takes thinking, out loud, it takes active conversation, it takes collaboration, it takes a willingness to truly look at the issues honestly. It takes some short-term solutions and some long-term solutions. With all of the hearts and minds in this room, we know we can come together and make a difference in El Dorado County. I thank our panelists very much. You were so helpful to us tonight. We really appreciate